You are now listening to the Fantasy Whisper Podcast with your hosts, Johnny, Game Time Hicks, and Big Travi. Wow, hello and welcome to the Fantasy Whisperers Podcast. That's Big Travi and I'm Johnny Game Time Hicks and we're here to give you that fantasy football fix right here on this wonderful, wonderful Tuesday night. Big Travi, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing excellent, Johnny. We're going to dive into some headache running back committees. You know, those things that are a little frustrating. Those shitty committees, if you will. Oh, <laughs> Miss me. <laughs> oh, I, I did. Oh, wait, I forgot. It is, it, it is now after eight o'clock. So <laughs> yeah. we are allowed to say whatever we want. Although we do try to keep this a little bit friendly on the language. We just couldn't come up with anything better than saying, calling them shitty committees. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about the frustration that they cause you in the fantasy season. It's no wonder we came up with this name. Once in a while, you know, you see a guy and he gets put on a team and you go, well, that's pretty shitty. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. And here we are. All right, Big Travi, we're going to jump into this show. But first, we got we got a little bit of information to go over. There's a lot of stuff that came out. So let's jump on in here, buddy. You got it. news and notes from around the NFL. All right, Big Travi, like always, our information comes from the Sleeper Bot. Get all right. the up-to-date news and information directly to your phone. All right, Travis, we're going to start off here with ESPN. Jer Jeremy Fowler reports Le'Veon Bell is expected to play the very first game of the season However, he's going to sit out all of preseason like he did last year. Is this going to affect where you're ranking Le'Veon Bell? No, not for me, Johnny. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we saw this story last year and it didn't really, really matter after the first couple of weeks, maybe even after the first week. Uh, we saw this guy put up those monster numbers down the stretch as he always does. Um, I am not worried about Le'Veon Bell unless it comes from his mouth that he's going to hold out into the season. Then I will be a little bit worried and concerned about dropping him. But right now, what we're seeing is a lot of speculation from other camps when we know he said in the past he plans on playing. Mm -hmm. So he's going to skip this other stuff per ESPN now. Uh, that I could see. He did it last year. But uh, like I said, I think after what happened last year, you got to think that he's going to get right back to form once he gets on the field. And I do want to touch on that. I think this just indicates that Le'Veon Bell after this year. So if you're in a dynasty league, this this might be in more information for you and a sense of that. I think Le'Veon Bell is done with the Steelers after this year. I think this is a, a sure sign saying that he will move on after this year. They're not going to franchise tag him another year because that would be something ridiculous. It would be like 30 million or something like that over yeah. this year. And his so, agent came out and said today, or maybe it was today or yesterday, basically that this basically means that, right, Johnny? I mean, yeah. it's something you've been saying all offseason that you thought it was his last year. His mm -hmm. agent affirmed it uh, after they did not get a deal done, saying, look, we tried. And, you know, Le'Veon Bell tweeted out, we tried. I wanted to be a Steeler for life. We tried and we failed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, much. Well, and then the other interesting news that came out along with that in that same backfield was – According to the athletic Mark Koboli, I don't know how to say that last name. Koboli. Um, Steelers second round running back James Conner was very impressive at spring practices. So really watch this guy in preseason. Uh, if you're in a keeper league, he might be someone that might be an interesting pickup late in drafts to just stash on your bench in the case that Le'Veon Bell leaves and now you're going to get a I mean, what could be a stud running back super late in draft. So just be watching out for that. All right. And then Larry Fitzgerald, my boy, Larry Fitzgerald has not ruled out playing beyond this season. Sounds like he was listening to the fantasy whispers a couple of episodes <laughs> ago when I pleaded for him not to give up after this year. I'm hoping he comes back. 
Man, I wonder if that says anything about what he's seen out of Josh Rosen. If he's excited about yeah. playing with Josh Rosen or even Sam Bradford for that matter. If he's excited about what's going on in the quarterback position, he might just be excited to keep playing. So, I mean, speaking of that conversation, Larry Fitzgerald did say it's been great working with Sam Bradford, calling him one of the pure passers in the NFL. So, yeah. that that could just be Listen, I see what you're saying. I think that we've seen that Bradford is great when he when he can stay upright and stay on the field. He's had great games. He's had great passer ratings, great efficiency. The problem has been him staying on the field. Yep, exactly. All right, so Cameron Meredith hopes to be cleared for training camp. Travis, is this a guy that you like to target deep in drafts, or do you think he's going to have any value in that Saints offense, knowing that they seem to kind of go towards the run a little bit more last year? I know you yeah, and I both expect them to continue with that pass and run ratio. Yeah, I think under Sean Payton, this is the first time they've had that kind of talent in the backfield. And so what you're seeing is a morph in his play calling style, which is just a you know a testament to him again, of what an offensive mastermind he is. But yeah, going back to your original question, Johnny, for me, uh, until this Saints team goes back to that old Drew Brees way, I think that they're doing everything right to ease Drew Brees into retirement, and that is to start to take more off of his plate. So no, I don't think Cameron Meredith is somebody I've been targeting deep in leagues. Wide receiver position in general is very deep, and he's just part of the you know the riffraff at this point. All right, and just a couple more things before we get into our show. We got the Rams. Your Rams have agreed to terms on a five-year contract extension with wide receiver Brandon Cooks. The team announced today. Are you excited? You, What do you think this kind of does for Brandon Cook's value, not only this year, but long term looking kind of at dynasties? So uh, for Brandon Cooks, I like it. I think it's great. It gives him an opportunity to grow with Jared Goff. I like it for Jared Goff. It gives him consistency at the wide receiver position. He gets to uh, have that guy and, and grow up with him. For the Rams, I... As a fan, I'm skeptical. You take all this money and you dump it into guys like Brandon Cooks and Donald's over there sitting in the corner. Aaron Donald is a world class NFL player and they have yet to sign the man. Um, mm -hmm. So I just I'm hoping they get it done. But, it, you know, he's got to be, you know, just balling his fist up Arthur style over there. Just a little upset. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I do know that Sean McVay has been all over uh, camp saying how fast Brandon Cooks is just loving the addition of Brandon Cooks. So I'm not surprised at the money here. Just mm. hope they sign Donald sooner rather than later. All right. And then last but not least, Ricky Seals Jones was arrested and charged with assault, disorderly conduct and criminal trespassing in Scottsdale, Arizona this past Saturday. Travis, uh, we talked about him on the last episode. I was expecting him to be kind of a sleeper tight end. And now this kind of, and this just destroys all of his value. I don't, I don't expect him to be with the team next year, knowing yeah. knowing what I know about the Cardinals and how they don't really stand for that stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they do. If they do just suspend him for four games or if they just decide to cut ties and figure out, you know, Jermaine Gresham is still here. So uh, that'll be that'll be definitely an interesting story to keep in mind. All right, Travis, you ready? Yep. I'm ready, uh, man. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Let's jump in here with our very first running back by committee that we're going to talk about, and that's going to be the New England Patriots. You want to kick it off with uh, your boy here? I believe you've met my fitness consigliere, Michelle. Tell us, yeah. tell us what you like about Sony Michelle this year, Big Travi. Well, the first thing I want to do, John, Johnny, is kind of break it down for the people about what happened in this backfield last year. So if we sum up last year in 2017, the Patriots were sixth in running back carries on the total of the year, fourth in running back rushing yards, fifth in running back yards per rush. They were also second in running back receptions on third in running back targets. So there is so much value in having shares of this backfield, Johnny. We know it. Every year they live in scoring range, especially with Belichick, especially with McDaniels, especially with Tom Brady. So you look at what they did in the offseason. Deion Lewis exits. He goes to Tennessee. They draft Sony Michel, how you just mm -hmm. said, and they sign Jeremy Hill. Now, Sony Michel is being 
ve valued very high by the fantasy football community. And you can see that in his ADP, Johnny. He's at 4.12. So the last pick or so, uh, depending on your league size, in the fourth round. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, though, Johnny, no rookie running back has ever finished as a top 20 running back under Bill Belichick, ever. Mm -hmm. We the, know the closest, I, I don't mean to cut you off there, but I, I do yeah. want to add on to this point is the the only running back that has ever really been drafted by the Bill Belichick's Patriots was Lawrence Maroney right. back in 2006. And he had a decent season. He had 175 yards and over uh, 700 yards rushing and six touchdowns. The touchdowns are nice. But at the same time, he he doesn't he didn't pass catch that much. He only had about 20 receptions that year. So not quite the same running back. So don't expect kind of maybe maybe the same rushing attempts, but not I expect more pass catching. Do you expect more pass catching coming from Sony Michel? Um, I, I imagine he'll be worked into it, but the, you got to remember they've got, you know, surefire veterans there and James White, who they trust in the passing game. And Burkhead wasn't a slouch, you know, in his own as far as uh, you know, points or as far as in the passing game for me, I just feel like you look at history and the, and the, you know, another concern is Sony Michelle on average was a pretty bad fumbler. Every 54.6 touch touches, he fumbled the ball for perspective, Johnny, the NFL average is one fumble per 125 touches. So, I mean, <laughs> that's a little <laughs> scary that he's coming in at that kind of number. I just think that Michelle's upside is capped a little bit with the Patriots running backs and how they work them in and how Belichick's done it over the years. So he would essentially for me and tell me if I'm wrong here, he'd have to hit into top 20 running back style just to get to his ceiling, uh, which what you're talking about where you draft him. And so for me, that's a little bit risky and we back it up and we talk about the guy that we're going to talk about next in Rex Burkhead. And his ADP is in the seventh round. So we're talking about a full, th he's 7.07. .07. He's a full mm -hmm. three rounds after um, uh, Sony Michelle. So Johnny, what do you like about Burkhead? Well, essentially the thing that I like the most is he's a Swiss army knife, right? He can yeah. do everything. He can run between the tackles. He can run outside. He can catch the ball out of the backfield in a, in a very consistent manner. And I think that's one reason why Bill Belichick was so comfortable getting rid of Deion Lewis, because they were essentially the same kind of running back. And I think that he could get away with the cheaper value in Rex Burkhead. And he's always going to go with the cheaper guy who can give him the same kind of output. You look at what Rex Burkhead did last year. Yes, he was injured in the beginning of the season, but when he started playing, he was very effective, even with Deion Lewis. This guy was yeah. averaging 7.8 carries a game, 3.3 catches, and he scored seven out of eight games. So yeah. you're, you're looking at a guy who, when it's in the red zone, they like to put him in because, one, he's sure-handed. He only had a couple of fumbles last year. And then, number two, you won't be able to tell. They can disguise their packages on whether it's going to be a run or a pass. And that's what Big Bill Belichick loves to do. He loves to disguise his plays, keep you guessing on defense, so that way you don't get used to or know what kind of uh, play they're going to be calling. So it's, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about this, Travis, and correct me if I'm wrong or if you have a different opinion, but when I'm looking at the draft value, Rex Burkhead seems to be the guy that I'm more interested in. You're talking about a little bit less of, of a draft stock. You're looking at a guy who he could clearly outperform his draft value. We saw it last year in the last eight games. And then guess what? If he doesn't pan out, you're not risking a big pick. You know, you have to hit or be as close to hitting on those first four to five picks as you can after that it's kind of a gamble and so give me uh the upside of rex burkhead with uh, a slightly less value attached to his name what do you yeah. what i'm i'm you know gonna reiterate basically what you said there i really like that and if you look at the advanced metrics and the advanced like things that rex burkhead is capable to do uh, th that is why Belichick fell in love with him last year from cincinnati brought him in and i just think that michelle 
yes, do I think they want to work eventually towards Michelle being the guy? Yeah, I think they use draft stock on him wisely. But mm -hmm. you look at Michelle, I'm not 100% sold on the fumble issue going away, and I'm not 100% sold on his pass blocking. And those two things will quickly get you off the field, especially in New England. And so for me... I I'm with you. You take a you take a stab at Rex Burkhead in the seventh or later, and then you're mm -hmm. you're looking at a real good opportunity after that. Um, yeah, you know, and then yeah. I, I, the one last thing I want to add here is that they have the 25th most difficult running back schedule. However, when you when you look at the playoffs, and you know, you and I always talk about this. You always look at the playoffs. You always got to assume that you're going to playoffs. Make, yeah. The, oh yeah. Uh, what's that uh, playoffs don't talk about playoffs you kidding me playoffs so i just hope we can win a game i uh so you always have to go with the assumption that you're going to make the playoffs all right be confident in yourself continue to listen to us and you'll definitely get there but yeah. what i'm going to say is that in the playoffs they have the sixth easiest pl uh, playoff schedule for running backs so that is a nice boost if you don't happen to get the one of those two guys, it might not be a bad idea to target one of the ones when you know kind of how this running back system shakes out. Although knowing what I know about New England and playing fantasy for many, many years, there's just not going to be Bill Belichick never has a workhorse back. He always goes with two running backs and usually they are both effective. So I like I said, I go with the 10. I tend to go with the draft stock on this one. Yeah, I'm with you there. Let's talk about another committee, Johnny. Let's give the people another shitty committee, if you will. And that is the Green Bay Packers, uh, obviously a team near and dear to my heart. If you look at the Packers last year, Johnny, they were 29th in running back carries. A little bit scary there that they didn't have the volume. But you look at what happened in the QB injury to Aaron Rodgers, running back injuries. Uh, we'll talk about that with these guys. And yet they were still able to produce that at 18th best in running back fantasy points and sixth in fantasy points per running back rushing attempt. So they were effective when they were able to run. They just did not run with a lot of volume mm -hmm. and they, you know, they weren't very effective on offense. We have the same mesh of guys that they, you know, worked through last year coming back. That's Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones and Ty Montgomery, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like with a healthy Rodgers and the ability for one guy to pull through in this backfield, you could be looking at a potential top 15 or top 10 guy if one guy takes over. And so now we got to start diving into him, Johnny. And the first guy I want to I want to get your uh, input on is Jamal Williams, right? His yep. ADP right now is the highest currently, and they're kind of getting closer together, all of them, as this offseason goes on. But his ID ADP is the highest currently at 7.12. So talk to the people a little bit about Jamal Williams. Well, when you're when you're looking at Jamal Williams, he led the Packers backfield in several categories after he was forced into action with Ty Montgomery's injury and Aaron Jones's injury a little bit in there in the middle of the, of the season. He had rushing touchdowns tied with Aaron Jones with four. He had total running back touchdowns with six. His running back receptions were 25 and his running back receiving yards he had 262. So nice little packages there. Again, this is a small sample size. If you look at that over an entire season, you are a little bit disappointed, but he had stretches in weeks 12 to 14 where he averaged 26.8 fantasy points, scoring five touchdowns. So Williams is a one cut style running back. And with that came a 3.6 yards per carry, which isn't the best I've seen worse. Um, I don't want to, name anybody but Trent Richardson um, <laughs> uh, uh, not good so, company to keep that's no, for sure not at all but he was able to average a whopping 10.5 yards per catch last year so you're talking about getting Aaron Jones or sorry Aaron Rodgers back and you definitely like to see that you know possibly go up as well as those running lanes will open up a little bit with Aaron Rodgers you're also talking about an offensive line who, according to Pro Football Focus, is ranked ninth in the league. So the big story that I'm going to focus on is if you can nail the right one, the right running back, and we will talk about which one we like the most, I do, like you said, expect a top 15 running back, but the trick will be grabbing the right one at the right value. 
Correct. Yeah. And you, you nailed it on the head with Jamal Williams there. That one cut style was effective last year when he got volume. Right. But mm -hmm. the, fa the fact of the matter is, was he that explosive? Did the one cut style hurt him? Um, we're at were defenses able to telegraph his running style. Um, so those are some of the things. So moving on to the next guy, uh, probably the guy I'm most excited about, Johnny, is Aaron Jones. Obviously, the suspension comes. And with that, his ADP has gone has suffered a little bit. He's currently at 8.06, but he was the most effective running back last year. He had 5.5 yards per carry versus the 3.6 we discussed, and then also 3.8 for Ty Montgomery. This guy showed flashes of explosive play, Johnny. Six runs of 20 yards or more last year, and that was 11th mm -hmm. in the NFL. And it only took him 81 carries to post those amount that amount of monster runs. I mean, so this guy was ripping them off. I remember the Tampa Bay game. We're in overtime, and he rips one off to win the game. I mean, that's just – it was amazing. So with the suspension, it's going to cause their his value to fall a little bit, but I like swooping him up later and then pairing him with Ty Montgomery, who we'll talk about next, because I think those are the guys that are more talented, if you will, in this backfield. And mm -hmm. right now you're getting both of them a little bit cheaper than you would if one of them were the guy. And so it's kind of not that bad of a, an idea to pair these. Here's what I really like, Travis, in Aaron Jones. He reminds me a lot of the Josh Gordon year where Josh Gordon, the year he exploded, if everyone remembers, he missed the first two games of that year. And he and because of that, because of the two game suspension for surprise, surprise, smoke and dope, he <laughs> he he dropped in in fantasy drafts. He was often dropped in the leagues within the first two weeks because players wanted to pick up the hot new waiver wire action and he was suspended. So why not drop him? He would be not an asset, right? So Aaron yeah, Jones yeah. is kind of like along the same mold. Although he wasn't smoking the ganja, he was uh, taking the old needle. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but so it's just along those same paths. You're talking about a guy who has very, very nice skill set, especially in an offense like the Green Bay Packers. Talking about a very nice skill set, and that is Ty Montgomery. We saw that a few a uh, year ago before he went down with the rib injury. This guy was looking like the real deal. I mean, yeah. I was I was really giving it to um, Mike McCarthy, who you know pushed and pushed all off season, saying Ty Montgomery is going to be our starting running back. I didn't necessarily 100% believe in it, but I will tell you over the first four weeks of last season, I was, I seriously thought I had made a huge mistake in my, in my game study of Ty Montgomery and his ability to not only run, but catch out of the backfield. Right. Again, the major concern is his injury status. He's never been able to stay healthy. And I think that that is going to cost him significantly this year. What are you thinking about when you're when you're evaluating Ty Montgomery? Yeah, the biggest piece I've taken is from what McCarthy has said about Montgomery and that they want to use him as this kind of chess piece, this flex package player. I mean, he loves the way that he can use guys like this. I mean, if you look at the way he's used Randall Cobb over his career when they try to line him up in the backfield, I mean, McCarthy really gets into his own ego on a lot of these uh these package guys, but that translates to me to not a very big role for Montgomery, at least to begin the year. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they really, I think they're going to give Jamal Williams the crack in the first two games and, you know, Montgomery will mix in there, but they love to pass. And I think Montgomery is going to have some value in the fact that he's going to be able to line up at that natural wide receiver position. So, mm -hmm. like I said, he's a little bit enticing if you can pair him with Aaron Jones, because you're going to get some of that value in the first couple games. And mm -hmm. then Aaron Jones comes back. I think he really works into it, and he's got the skill. Montgomery, I just don't think, is going to get enough work on the long haul of the season to, to be worth it for me. Yeah, and I will say, Travis, what, what would you say, if you had to choose one of these guys at the current draft value, which one are you the most confident in drafting? You can only choose one. I got to take Aaron Jones, man. The explosion... Mm -hmm. Uh, the value that he's coming out with that ADP in the eighth round. And that could fall, Johnny, with this yeah. uh, with this suspension. I could really see that because it already fell a little bit uh, where mm -hmm. these guys were neck and neck in ADP. And now it's changed a little bit. It's gone almost a half a round uh, in difference. 
So I could see that continuing to fall, which means Jones is just going to continue to be a great value. And I'll say it again. It only took him 81 carries to get six runs over 20 plus yards. That is home run ability. And that's what you love to see, especially in late round running backs. I don't know about you, but for me, it's Aaron Jones. Yeah, and I certainly I second that opinion. I think Aaron Jones is the value here. Like I said, yes, you're going to get him at a discount because he's going to be out those first two weeks. However, there is a little bit built in safety there. And the fact that if Jamal Williams can't get off to a, a quick start, which, by the way, I don't expect that to happen because the Green Bay Packers have the most difficult running back schedule of any team. So I don't expect him to get off to a quick start and they're going to be looking for a solution a la Aaron Jones coming back and there's going to be a lot of hype around him. So I do like Aaron Jones the most. And like you also said, I do expect that that uh, that value to dip even more as we get closer and closer to the season. I expect Ty Montgomery to actually surplant that value of Aaron Jones, maybe flip those due to the suspension suspension yes. yeah thank you all right going into our third backfield here probably one of the ones that i'm the most excited about travis and that is the baltimore ravens deep or backfield of alex collins and kenneth dixon so the first guy that we're going to talk about here is going to be is going to be alex collins but before i jump into alex's collins stats let's look at baltimore ravens stat as a whole so in 2017 they were third in running back carries they were third in running back yards they had the eighth in running back yards per carry average along with the 10th in fantasy points per rush that is just really really positive notes when you're looking at running backs i mean all the signs are pointing up and then on the top and then to top that all off and which might you know help out our second guy in this backfield, Kenneth Dixon. He had the fourth, they had the fourth in running back targets and completions. Joe Flacco checked down King along with Alex Smith. Travis, what are you liking about this Baltimore offense and their running back situation? Yeah. So Johnny, if you look at last year, they lost two linemen, right? The call, uh, both between both of them, it was over 30 games, right? So they not only lost the lineman, then they had Kenneth Dixon go down, obviously with the meniscus and the suspension, and then Woodhead got hurt, right? So Alex Collins comes in. He's this fifth rounder that got cut from the Seahawks. And you look at this, you know, Johnny, you just listed all these top 10, top five in some cases of running back um, backfields in the NFL. And Alex Collins is the reason those numbers are so great. I mean, the guy came in and just did work. He averaged 19.2 touches. Uh, per game from week eight on, he had 20 receptions in his last seven games. So there's all this talk about his receptions. And yet, if you would have extra extrapolated that out over the year, he would have caught about 45 catches. I mean, that's great as far as bell cow numbers uh, to be able to do. My favorite thing was he was rated as the eighth best running back in rushing success by football outsiders last year. Rushing success better at the eighth best. And he was better than Le'Veon Bell and Mark Ingram. So, I mean, he was running successfully hard and breaking tackles uh, better than some of the best in the league. He was able to finish as a top 15 running back, even though he didn't get legitimate starter step, uh, starter snaps until after week eight. So the concern is the passing down work like we ended, uh, we talked about, and he only, he only ended up with 6% of the target share. You know, obviously they worked in Buck Allen where they could. Um, and we'll talk a little, I mean, we won't talk too much about him because I think that yeah. what we're going to see is that, you know, Ken Dixon has a shot to come in here, mm -hmm. uh, and take receiving down work. And so you really need to watch, right? We need to mm -hmm. watch and you'll talk about Kenneth Dixon here in a second, but we really need to watch Kenneth Dixon on the depth chart. If he starts to creep up and they start to say, no, he's our number two guy and he's going to come in and he's going to spell Alex Collins because first of all, Harbaugh is not being committal to Alex Collins at all. And he hasn't been all off season, and that's with the you know crappier backs uh, there. Now he's talking. Kenneth Dixon comes in, takes the number two spot, and they're not committal to Collins. I feel bad for Collins. He ran hard last year, but Kenneth Dixon, as Johnny will uh, will explain, was highly touted out of college. He's a very elusive back. He has he was he's great hands, 
and could just be the guy that they want to move forward with. And this is their last real shot to kind of look at him, in my opinion, before they might need to be moving on. So uh, for me, Collins is looking a little bit high in price, and he's a little bit risky. You just don't know. Can he repeat what he did? Can he get involved in the passing game enough? Um, and can he do more with his targets? Because he didn't. I think he averaged something around six yards uh, per target, and that's not the greatest. So, yeah, uh, Johnny, tell the people a little bit about Kenneth Dixon. So the major news that came out about Kenneth Dixon yesterday was the fact that he was not going to start the season on the pup list. Now, when it was originally released, that news, it was, wait a second, why, why, why should we be impressed by this? Isn't Kenneth Dixon healthy? Didn't he, wasn't he suspended all last year? And yeah, he was, but like you mentioned, he had that knee injury. And so there was some concern at whether or not they were going to be, he was going to be healthy for the start of this year. Now it comes out that he is going to start mini camp. And like you said, this to me boosts Kenneth Dixon's value a lot because now you're talking about a guy who coming out of college was super electrifying. Watching his pro tape, was it was unheard of all the missed tackles he was forcing i'm talking when he was a rookie i was so high on him that i wanted to i wanted to draft him in every single league and i i was expecting a lot and then when he kind of didn't meet those expectations or at least the expectations that many thought he was going to meet because he got injured or he wasn't given the full workload it made people disappointed but i want to remind people he finished 2016 as an RB13 in the final six weeks. He had 281 yards, two touchdowns, 20 catches for 114 yards, and a touchdown on 27 targets. You extrapolate that over a full season if he is given the full workload, you're looking at a very good running back that you're currently getting in the 13th round. Yeah. He's definitely a guy that you should take a waiver on and Actually, for this backfield, the thing that I love about it the most is they're both relatively cheap. So I don't even mind taking a stab at both of these guys, having both of these guys in the backfield, because I don't care if, if you have both of them. I do think this is going to be a very nice backfield to have. And you're talking about very low draft costs relative to owning that backfield. So you look at many, many people that were touting Dixon coming out of college and he was rated as the number three running back in 2016. He had 87 all purpose touchdowns in college. Like that just doesn't happen if you're a mediocre football player. And I think if anything that we can learn through all of this, Travis, and is the fact that they haven't let him go and he's been suspended right. and injured twice. So they must see something in him and that wants that makes them want to keep him. So for right. that reason, I like Kenneth Dixon a lot. I've always been a big fan of his, but I think this could be his breakout year. And this is his last year to show something. If they if he doesn't prove something this year, they're gonna cut him, and that's it. Yeah. That's his career. But if he does prove something, they'll sign him again. They really like him. So I really like Kenneth Dixon this year. Yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head when you said, what did Baltimore really do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't do anything in the offseason to sign anybody. You know, they kept the same receiving specialist backs in, in uh, Buck Allen and Woodhead. And so they they were confident enough in Collins and Dixon to lead, I think, the majority of this. And especially Dixon, if you're going to keep him on the roster. And, you know, once again, I will repeat some of these stats up here. Third in running back carries, third in running back yards, fourth in targets and completions. And that was without Marshall Yonda last year, Johnny. That was without yep. Alex Lewis. They missed these linemen, right? And they were yep. still a, a giant productive uh, backfield. So when you talk about how you, you're down on yourself for last year for being high on Dixon, you weren't alone. A lot of the fantasy community, uh, community was having him above Jordan Howard or the likes of him because look mm -hmm. at what the backfield can do when given the opportunity. You had a fifth-round cut running back in Alex Collins pop off last year for the last eight weeks. Kenneth mm -hmm. Dixon could be poised. It's 
to me, it's madness if you're not taking him in the 13th round because of what he can return on that value. I mean, it's insane. Oh, yeah. So like and we said, if you get Collins and you're feeling risky, you're feeling that in your stomach, you're like, oh, God, I don't know about this. It's really cheap to get Kenneth Dixon right now. Now, I'm going to say a disclaimer. I well, think that his ADP is going to rise, Johnny. I think that yeah. as he gets to be the number two back for sure, you'll start yeah. hearing more beat writer stuff because Harbaugh is going to be non-committal again, mm -hmm. um, and Dixon's going to come in. But man, oh man, is that value like? I'm but, like but to, but to yeah. that point, but to that point, Travis, that let's say it does rise. Let's say right. it, he's in the thirteenth now. Even if it's not gonna ride, it's not gonna jump significantly. Like it's not gonna all of a sudden go all the way up to the seventh round. Like even if it goes up three to four rounds, you're talking about a ninth rounder. And if you invest in Alex Collins, I would even say reach, reach around early and make sure you pick him up so you can solidify this this running back. Because essentially, when you're looking at those running backs in the ninth, tenth round. You're just throwing darts anyway. Why not solidify a backfield who, guess what, has the seventh easiest running back schedule, and then you look towards the playoffs, number one easiest schedule according to Pro Football Focus. So right. give me that running back. I don't mind reaching a little bit to get him if I get Alex Collins, and you're going to get you're gonna be happy with this backfield. I, I, I fully am confident in that. Yeah, I would agree. Nothing. In fact, I think the backfield has a real good shot to improve upon those numbers based mm -hmm. on an all pro and Marshall Yonda coming back. So I think we're in agreement. This is a very cheap at the moment uh, backfield to own yep. and uh, very productive, but a, a backfield that is not very productive, Johnny. Mm -hmm. And that's the fourth and final backfield we're going to talk about tonight. And I know what you're saying. That's the last one, guys. But this is going to be a multiple part series, yep. so stay tuned. We just didn't feel it was right to go through all of them in one night. There's a lot right. of running back com by committees. I think um, Corbin had a great comment. He said, "Yeah, that's only true. Nine backs with a thousand yards last year, but 31 with 600 yards. Running back by committee is the future of the NFL, and and I definitely agree." But you can still find the value. You can find the gems within those running back by committees, and that's what we're going to to tell you guys about over the next couple of weeks. So stick with us. But jumping back into this Detroit Lions backfield, Travis, you're looking at a backfield that last year, now these stats aren't going to be pretty at all, okay? <laughs> they are the they were the 27th in running back carries, the 31st in yards. They were tied for last in yards per carry, 21st in fantasy points per rush, and there was some work in the passing game. They were 16th most in targets and 19th most in receptions. And I, you know, looking at this backfield now and what they have, I actually really like this offensive line. I think this offensive line is the best offensive line that Detroit's had in a long time. But at the same time, you're looking at running backs and, and we're going to touch on them, but carry on Johnson, LeGarrette Blunt. You know, uh, Theo Riddick, Theo Riddick, and Amir Abdullah. It's you know that's <laughs> nothing to re get real excited about. But Travis, if there's anyone that we would consider, it's probably this guy. You want to touch on on your boy here? Carry on my wayward son. Yeah, man, Carry on Johnson once again. Best name of all rookies coming in to this. For sure. Carry on for a running back. That is amazing. <laughs> so they must have known that he was going to be a running back. But I, I mean, you look at this, right? They traded for him. They not only traded up Johnny to get carry on Johnson, they took him over Darius Geis, who you and I know was. And if the people don't know, he was the second most touted running back behind Saquon Barkley. Right. Mm -hmm. So as far as talent and what he did in the SEC, Another guy from the SEC was Carryon Johnson, right? He went to Auburn. He was the 2017 SEC Offensive Player of the Year. He had 1,585 yards and 20 touchdowns. He only caught 32 passes, though, in three years in college. So we've got to see more work. But I'm not saying he's not capable. They just didn't throw to him a ton. They pounded the rock, right? I think he's going to be capable. I think he's got good hands. But one of the things he's got is a 4.52 speed, which he put on display at the Auburn Pro Day. He's drawn NFL comps to Arian Foster, Johnny. I mean, he just 
Yeah, I'm getting a little excited over here because they say the way that he runs upright, the way he kind of glides as he runs. And then you look at what they're saying about him in Detroit, right? The running backs coach is calling him a three down player. The GM is gushed about his overall ability as well. As well. There's just major concerns, right? The backfield was not to, uh, productive, as we said. How much were the, will the others eat into his role? I mean, I could see a situation, Johnny, where Carryon Johnson gets 200 carries, right? But he mm -hmm. doesn't put on a bunch of flipping points because, you know, they throw in LeGarrette Blunt in the red yeah. zone and Theo Riddick catches a couple touchdowns here and there and he just gets vultured. So yeah. for me, I would love to just wholeheartedly go carry on Johnson. I think we're going to be a year or two removed from carry on Johnson being the man in Detroit and changing the narrative on running backs in Detroit, but maybe not this year. And maybe it's, or maybe it's not till later in the year. Um, right now is ADPs at seven Oh four. Some of those guys down there, I'm okay with taking carry on Johnson, depending on what you've done with your running back. Right. right. Uh, if you, if you're stacked at running back and you, and you got a one anchor wide receiver or something, you want to take a stab at carry on Johnson. Okay, I could see that because if he wins the job outright or if Riddick, you know, Riddick's getting up there in age. So if Riddick goes down with an injury, Larry LeGarrette Blunt doesn't catch the football. I mean, that's just not something he does. So um, I think carry on Johnson is one big game away from really taking over this backfield and being the guy that, you know, the first guy to give Stafford kind of that one two punch. Yeah. But, and, and then, well, I, I just want to touch on. The real concerning part in all of this is that if you look at the Detroit Lions last year, right, they only ran the ball 23% of the time when they were when they were down by less than 8. So, and even when and then even when they were up, they still only ran the ball 40% of the time, which in perspective, that's not good. Like, yeah. Th that just goes to show how bad the running game was. You want you know, you're talking about like the New England Patriots who they have Tom Brady and they're they're closer to 50 50. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up the Patriots, right? Because the Detroit Lions new head coach is Matt Patricia. So he's part of that Belichick coaching tree. He's going to yeah. want to lean more on the run. Obviously, they did still Very bring back Jim Bob, Jim Bob Cooter, right? So they're still <laughs> the going to have the second best name in all of football, Jim Bob <laughs> Cooter. Uh, they're going to have him calling plays right and so yes he didn't run as much but i gotta think that if patricia got his ear and you hear the way that matt patricia's talking about carry on johnson and they bring in legarrette blunt who you're going to talk about next mm -hmm. they want to run the football more i think it's a concentrated effort they want to uh we'll see if that you know equates to anything they still do have matt stafford who they he loves to chuck the ball so yep. anything you like about legarrette blunt this year is he going to be on any of your rosters coming into this year um, no, I, I don't foresee myself drafting LeGarrette Blunt. I think even if LeGarrette Blunt on, in all honesty, were by himself and you had Theo Riddick and Amir Abdullah behind him and they didn't go out and spend a high draft pick, I still wouldn't be excited about LeGarrette Blunt. You're talking about a guy who's going in the ninth round. We were just saying how Kenneth Dixon was going in the 13th round and he could jump all the way up to the ninth. I definitely like like Kenneth Dixon over LeGarrette Blunt. Another guy is T.Y. Yeah, sure. uh, Ty Montgomery. I would rather have yeah. Ty Montgomery than Le LeGarrette Blunt. You look at what he averaged last year uh, last year in 4.4 yards per carry. That is good. I will give him that. But guess what? That was again that was behind the best offensive line in football in the Philadelphia Eagles. And yet he was still only able to score three touchdowns. He has only scored double digit touchdowns in one year. And that was with 2016 New England Patriots in which he had 18. And we all remember that year because he won a lot of people championships. But his average, he averaged a pathetic 6.8 receptions per season. Let me repeat that. <laughs> he averaged over an entire season 6.8 receptions. That's horrendous. That's his career That's, average. That is yeah. terrible. Yeah, so if you're if you draft Legarrette Blunt, you are hoping for you are literally hoping and wishing for a touchdown if you have to play him. So to me, I I would rather have Theo Riddick than Legarrette Blunt, even though I'm not really high on Theo Riddick or Amir Abdullah. Uh, both of those guys are currently going undrafted in most cases, or Theo Riddick is finding himself at the late end of of drafts. But I would rather have. Theoretic than LeGarrette Blunt at that draft value. 
Yeah, and I uh, I just want to hit on it again. You know, the reason I like Carry On Johnson so much is because Legarrette Blunt, yes, Theo Riddick's there, but Riddick mm -hmm. is also getting up there in age, mm -hmm. and you know he's a smaller back. So for me, I like Carry On Johnson to get more work in the passing game. They're not just going to give it all to Theo Riddick. I think you know there is some st you know there are some passes there that Carry On Johnson caught in, in college, and albeit not a lot. But I think Carry On Johnson has the ability to do that, where Blunt does not. So mm -hmm. they're not going to have Blunt in eating a ton of snaps from Carry On Johnson. The that's the that's the other downside though to Carry On Johnson is he's got to fend off Blunt and Theo Riddick in different mm -hmm. spots. So just you know, be careful. Like we said, it's not like those other backfields we talked about tonight, where you can kind of pair them with another guy to try and mm -hmm. win it out. Like these are all three different style backs, um, yeah. specifically in Blunt. And theoretic, they're definitely contrasting styles. Yeah. So for me, you got to be able to draft carry on Johnson if you have running back depth and you're stashing this guy to explode as the number one guy in Detroit, then you're sitting pretty. All right, Travis, one last question before we close out the show. Yes, if sir. you have to rank all of these backfields from one to four that we talked about and your interest in them or how you would draft them, in what order would you go? This is easy. Uh, New England Patriots would be number one. The Green Bay Packers would be number two. Then, the, well, actually, no, I take that back. Sorry, the New England Patriots would be number one. The Baltimore Ravens backfield would be number two. The number three would be the Green Bay backfield, and number four would be Detroit. So the only reason I give the nod uh, to Baltimore is the production that they put up last year. We know they're going to run. Uh, Green Bay loves to throw the football. We talked about it, I think, in the last episode. They run the, or they throw the football pretty much, you know, almost 60% of the time in the red zone. So they, they know who they have at quarterback. So for me, I'm actually going to flip New England and Baltimore. I would say Baltimore wow. number one, New England number two. I would go number three as the Green Bay Packers and for Detroit. And I'll tell you why. And that's for the fact that Joe Flacco is getting up there in age, right? So. Yeah. They brought in Lamar Jackson. Now, I'm not projecting Lamar Jackson to start this year. However, if Joe Flacco does go down, they are running a run pass option, RPO all over the field. And you're talking about Kenneth Dixon in the RPO. That's that's something that's going to be exciting, right? And then you want to talk about the, the other aspect is just the pure value, right? So you have, when I'm talking about draft stock, the draft stock is a little bit less for me for Baltimore, and I love their playoff schedule and their entire schedule where New England has a, a bit of a more difficult schedule, although we're talking about New England here, so throw that out the window a little bit. But <laughs> so th that's just if, if I'm and it's and it's really, really close. I mean, I'm nitpicking here. Yeah, but for me, it just it would be that slight edge to the Baltimore running backs and then New England, and then Green Bay and then Detroit. All right, Travis, that's it for today's show. We got a quick announcement to make in not this weekend, but next weekend. Join Big Travi and I in Venice Beach, California. We are going to be taking over the Bank of Venice in Venice Beach, and we're going to do a kickoff show there. We're going to have some prizes that we're going to be giving away, some raffles, drink specials, the whole shoot and shebang. Travis, you want to add anything to that? No, we just love to see anybody that's local to the area or visiting California in that time. Come out and say hi. We're going to have some swag. We're going to have some giveaways. We're going to have a live interactive show with the audience. We'd love to take some pictures with you guys, meet you, and we'd love uh, to have your support. Come out and take a look. And uh, we are excited about this. And obviously, we have Face Off Friday coming up this Friday, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, that's on YouTube. And I just want to say thank you guys for watching tonight. And we look forward to uh, hearing or seeing you next time. All right. Until next time on part two of the <laughs> committee. <laughs> I'm Johnny Game Time Hicks, and that's Big Travi. And we're out. Always, like always, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Check this show out. Check out Mock Draft Mondays. Until next time, I'm Johnny Game Time Hicks, and that's Big Travi. We're out. Peace. 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 Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Whisperers podcast. 
can hear more from John and Travis on Google Play, SoundCloud, and iTunes. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at TF Whispers.